Hey, I made one of the most catastrophic mistakes you could ever make in land navigation at the Special Forces course. And on today's episode of our 10 part mini series, we're gonna dive into that. But if you just stumbled here and you're like, what the hell am I listening to? My name is Zach Hughes. I'm the CEO of Operators Association. I'm a former Green Beret. And we are on episode five of my 10 part mini series detailing chronologically my direction from the streets all the way to getting a Green Beret. And today we're talking about the 12 mile rock, the map reading classes, some ranger bead stuff, and more specifically the land navigation absolute disaster that I executed. And somehow I made my way back and, and made it out of that nightmare. Uh, but listen to me, you don't, want the, you don't want to learn these lessons the hard way. Dive into this podcast, dive into this episode today and understand to not be like me. Hello and welcome to the Operators Association podcast. I'm your host, former Green Beret Zach Hughes. And really, a few administrative notes. As I started thinking about my time in selection, things began to get very, very hazy. I don't have a very good recollection of what is a memory of mine, what's a memory of someone else's, what's a memory from a book I read. It really starts to get pretty muddled because of the lack of sleep, the incredible stress that you're putting on your body. So I'm just going to throw this out there, full disclosure, I'm not 100% accurate on a lot of the stuff that we're discussing because I cannot be for certain if this was something that I was dreaming, something that just popped into my head during one of our ruck marches, if these conversations that I had with people, sometimes they even happen or didn't happen. I'm just not quite 100% there. So I just want to give it full disclosure to everybody. Selection is a beast of in its own that you will probably never replicate in your entire life. And a lot of your memory is right out the window when you get in not only highly stressful situations, but also situations where your body is completely exerted and you're being tested. So I just want to let everybody know that. So basically what we did is we discussed the first few days of selection in processing the PT test, the ruck march, the APFT, some of the running, the adult education stuff that comes in, the test that you have to take at the very beginning. And that really encompasses the first phase of selection. There's really four phases of selection. These aren't official phases, but they're, they're very clear that you kind of transition in different ways. The first phase being the onboarding, where you do your run and you do your, your tests and you put your priorities in list, and then you kind of get ready for the incredible suck fest that's about to happen. The second phase is really day three to probably day 12, somewhere in there, give or take a few days, depending on the weather and what happens in your individual course. But there you kind of pivot and you're done with the onboarding process and you begin some map reading courses. You get to go out to the compass course. You get to go do your land navigation practical exercises. You subsequently do the land navigation exam. Then you're going to pivot to what's called common task training or team week. And then from that, you'll really pivot to the, the third portion. So we're going to start at that second phase of selection this time. 12 mile ruck march for me, 55 pounds dry then you add your MREs or your water. That's gonna change depending on the time of year, how many heat casualties they had in the class before you, how many guys have gone down because of heat or because of cold in the class that you're in. So they, it's an arbitrary number that can be moved depending on the injuries that are mounting up in your class. For me, it was 55 pounds dry. Then you add your MREs and then you add your water. Some classes it's 45 pounds. Some classes, I haven't heard of it being higher than 55 in the last number of years. But I have it very common that it'll go down to, to 45 when there's some issues with either it's too hot or guys are going down, things like that. So it's, it's interesting the first time you do your 12 mile ruck march because you get to understand sort of some of the roads behind Camp McCall and, and see some of the iconic places that you're going to continue to see throughout selection. As you're doing your first ruck march and you start to wind down you're on the, the downhill slope of this thing, you're in mile like seven or eight you come across this tank that's out there in the field and it's a very iconic tank. You'll see it so many times during selection. You just, you get to grow and see as you evolve through, through selection that you understand the terrain and you understand the roads and you kind of can map out exactly where you are. So by the time that you're at the end of selection, you're like, okay, there's the tank. So I know where we are. We've got a, a little bit more longer to go. We've got X, Y, Z. And the first ruck marks, you're like, oh, cool. There's a tank out here. This is interesting but you're just so focused on crushing the ruck march that you really don't pay attention because you're running past it. Uh, but it's also a good point where they'll consistently have water for you to refill your water. That's pretty common on a 12 mile ruck march. If you have no, if you've never done one before in the military, they consistently have water at like random spots. They'll have a Buffalo, which is just hundreds and hundreds of gallons of water. 
and they'll also have like little stations set up and you can get your water there. You can fill up your canteens, things like that. They almost always have water at that tank. So it's very, very easy for you to remember where the tank is in relation to how much further you have to go. And this is your first opportunity to, to see the tank. Now on that 12 mile ruck march, people are going to fail. The very first one out of the gates, people fail it. And if you fail a ruck march and you're healthy, you're just, you're in really bad shape. Conducting a 12 mile ruck march in under three hours with 65 pounds is pretty doable. I would say, especially if you're in the 45 pound class, unfortunately it's going to be hotter as well, but hopefully you start earlier. It's definitely doable. So if you're an individual who's not injured and you really have nothing else going on, the ruck march is not going to be that bad for you to pass. You're going to want to crush it and you're going to kill your body. I came in on mine during selection at a ridiculously fast pace, and I shouldn't have, but you just don't know. You, you want to be first at everything because you don't know how this thing's weighted. And the reality is, to kind of open the hood for you guys, is you don't have to be the first person back on the ruck march. You just can't fail. This isn't a hierarchy where they talk, take the top 25%. You would not know that unless you're listening to this podcast or you've heard it somewhere else, but you just have to pass all of the things and then not be dropped out during team week for a lack of leadership. But lack of leadership does not mean he was average at the ruck marches. It just doesn't cut it that way. That's not how it works. You've just got to pass it. So inevitably, even knowing that, you're going to go out there and give it all you can because you're a competitor, and that's just who you are as a person. And I respect that, and I totally think you should do that as well. But just understand that coming in 12th on a ruck march is no different than coming in 212th as long as you're under the three-mile mark. And it's very, very important information for your psyche and for your mental health as you're going through this thing. If you happen to be average to sub-average, as long as you're passing, I need you to understand that you're still in a really, really good spot. That being said, you should be crushing everything you do. Ruck March, you're going to crush this thing. You've got your boots. Everything's in order. You're probably going to have blisters. Maybe you've gotten past blisters by then. You, you, if not, you've done really well and learned very, very quickly how to doctor your blisters up. At least I did. I had an entire surgical kit that I was very, very methodical where I would use string and basically mole skin and this entire setup every time I had a blister because I exactly knew how to do it. And you take mole skin, which is a product that you live by in the army, and cut out a hole, put your blister in that hole, and then you also you sew around the outside of your blister uh, to create these micro tears and these micro holes so it can, it can filter out the, uh, the liquid that comes in. Um, and I can get into a little bit more detail about that, but they teach you all of this stuff out there. They come by and they literally teach you proper foot maintenance. So if you're paying attention and you're not just out there looking at the trees, you're going to know how to do this and you're going to get to practice it quite a bit. So into the ruck march, you either pass or you fail. You, if you fail, you go into one line. You don't ever see those guys again. If you pass, you go into the normal line. And you kind of get to hang around with your dudes, drink some water, catch up, breathe, and, and get ready for the rest of the day. All the days are different, so it, it, it really depends on each class how these things are set up. But you're going to do a certain amount of each of these things during selection period. So if your course, you do land nav after you do team week, who knows? It's shuffled around and the schedule is not exactly the same. So it's just going to depend, but you are going to touch each of these. And I'm just going to go through in the order that we did mine that I best remember. And you can kind of plug and play with each of your individual selections. So first you're going to do a map reading course. So the day that you do some incredibly early physical fitness thing afterwards, you've got to fill into the auditorium and it's time to really learn how to work a compass and learn how to read a map. And you've been taught this a few times at basic training and you've been taught this at the prep course if you're an x-ray and not if you haven't been to the prep course. But this is your chance to be in a controlled environment that's like a classroom and ask questions and really dig in and understand exactly how to read maps and exactly how to plot points. If you've never been taught that before, they give you an ample opportunity to learn right there. Guys are definitely keyed in and paying attention if they're not trying to fall asleep. For the most part, everyone's really, really adamant about knowing exactly what's going on because they know this is the number one reason that people fail selection, land navigation, period. So you'll go through a map reading course where they talk to you about the legend and how to orientate the map and how to read everything and how everything looks. It's fairly detailed. This is a long course. We're talking four or five hours. It, is, it goes into it deep. The next day, you'll go into compass stuff, and they'll describe how you should use your compass, how you use your compass with your map. This is still all in the classroom. 
literally four or five hours, long, long classes, very, very detailed because they want to make sure that you get all the information you can. Now you're crushed because you, you're doing exercises and you're doing these crazy things in the morning and the evenings. But this is the important time is these classes that you're learning how to succeed in eventually what will be a land navigation exercise. So after you've done a class on the map, you've done a class on the compass, you've done a class combining the map and the compass, what you're going to do is you're going to go out into the woods and you're going to go to their compass course. And what it is is a very, very abbreviated land navigation course. And it's where you put your compass on a certain thing and make sure it's, it's not messed up and that it's reading the right numbers. And then you're going to plot a point and kind of walk to that point and see how many steps you, 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 it takes you to get to that point in the woods. And then there'll be 100 meters on the side, not in the woods, and you walk that 100 meters and you figure out how many steps you, you, it took you specifically, like your gait, to get to 100 meters, whatever that is. Um, say it's like 52 steps. You, you step 52 times between this time you start this thing and the time you get to 100 meters. Well, that's really important. And you do that a few times and you do that at night and you do that with your eyes closed and you do that through the woods when you're kind of stumbling around and track off 100 meters so that you know when you're walking, well, every 21 steps or every 54 steps is 100 meters. So when you plot a point and you know that you have a point that's 1,000 meters away or a click, well, you walk it 10 times, you've got to get to that 54 steps. So that's where ranger beads come in to play, land navigation beads. These are products that you can buy that you can take to selection that tie on to your equipment. And it's essentially like counting marbles. It's a string. Every 100 meters you walk, you pull the string. You, you walk another 100 meters, you pull the string. You walk another 100 meters, you pull the string. And it's like these little beads on, on top of it. It looks like a friendship bracelet, but it's, it's just one string. And then you, if you get lost or you forget where you are, well, you pull up the string that's connected to your hip, and it's got three beads at the bottom and four on the top. So you're like, okay, three at the bottom. I've only walked 300 meters. This is so important. You will be so incredibly lost without this. We had guys out there that were picking up pebbles, and they would put pebbles in their pockets. And then after they walked 100 meters, they would move one pebble from their right pocket to the left pocket. And it's just absolutely ridiculous because there's a product that you can buy called Ranger Beads that are meant for this. <laughs> and it's so simple and it's a very easy product and it's cheap and they allow you to use it. You have to, this is like a mandatory piece of equipment that you have to have. Some people come out there and they don't, they're just like, oh, I'll just figure it out or I'll remember. Well, that you probably would remember any other time, but after you haven't slept and the stakes are high and you're running and you forgot something, something crazy is going on, all these things, chaos you may not remember in the middle of the night after you've been up for two days and walking for 20 miles that you're on pace number 54 of 400 meters. So you need that piece of equipment to do it. They teach you all of these tricks. They show you how to do it. You get your 100 meter pace, which for me, I'm pretty sure was 54 steps. I could be way off, but that's just the number that resonates with me when I think about this. And that's typically your pace that you're going to run during land navigation. So you need to know that's like so imperative how many steps does it take to get to 100 meters because you don't have a gps you have no way of figuring it out and you've got to have a way to gauge how far you're tracking some people also do time so how long does it take you to walk a kilometer you have to do that at night on the actual practicums you can't really do that from their practice course during the day that that compass course you have to do that when you head out into the field you'll have exactly a click between where you are and some intersection of a road or something like that you get lucky and you have a very defined distance from where you are right now, whether it be your starting point or some other point or an intersection, to the next checkpoint that you have. And we'll just say it's a, it's a kilometer, right? I've got to go from here to this kilometer, this thousand meters, in however long it takes. And so you set a timer, you look at your watch, and it's like, okay, nine o'clock. And then you get to the one kilometer and it's 9.52. And you're like, okay, well, on average, I can move a kilometer in 52 minutes without getting lost as long as I'm moving forward. And you kind of take that into account at 3 a.m. when you've completely got lost and you know where you started, but you don't really know where you are now, you can ballpark and say, well, I looked at my ranger beads and I walked 500 meters and I've spent about two and a half hours walking in this general direction based on my compass. And now I kind of know where I'm at on this map as opposed to just being stupid lost I can get on the map and literally draw a circle that's probably where I'm at, given the time, given the steps, given the ranger beads. 
And then you look at that and you're like, okay, well, how can I get to somewhere where I can know where I'm at? Well, probably let's just go straight for a road or let's go for an intersection. Let's go for a big pond. Let's go for the draw. Let's go for something to that I can restart. Let's go to the, the last point I was at so I can restart and know exactly where I'm at. Um, and that's typically how that works. And there's some other techniques that they teach you about getting your bearing straight when you're on a road or things like that. Um, it is important to note that you can use the roads to figure out where you are in terms of your compass. So say you want to look and see what the azimuth of this particular road is that you come across, this dirt road. Well, you get in the middle of the road and you pull up your compass and you can see what direction that road's running. You could probably cross that cross-reference on the map with a road that's similarly going in that direction. But the only problem is if you pull out your map on the road, you can be road killed. That's illegal. So what you do is you get out your compass on the middle of the road and you get your, your numbers that you think you might need. And then you walk away from the road, however far they say, typically 50 meters. And then you can pull out your map and do the work. But you cannot navigate with your map on the road during selection. You will get 100% can. And now if you listen to our podcast last week with the gentleman that came on who failed land navigation, that is still a huge thing. Guys, if they pull out their maps, it doesn't matter how far along you, you are. He was describing a guy who went eight for eight, got all of his points, but he was in the middle of an intersection with his map pulled out, and he was road killed and subsequently kicked off of selection and could not go any further with his Green Beret dreams because he was in the middle of the street. It's an interesting podcast. Uh, side note, if you're an aspiring operator in that tier, you have access to that. It's on the Patreon page. I definitely recommend you go back and kind of look at that podcast and listen. That guy really, really lays it out for all of our members. I think it's absolutely a value added for anyone. We dove in pretty deep on land navigation, but I think it's really important to know what you're getting into and, and see exactly how they're going to teach you. So you go to the compass course, which is kind of a joke. It's during the day. You just you get your bearings of how many steps are in 100 meters, how you actually go from point to point. And then they're like, okay, cool. Sounds good. Looks like you're ready. We're going to send you out to the woods with your entire rucksack full of a bunch of crap. It's going to weigh a lot, a lot of water a ton of MREs for at least three or four days, and you're going to go out there and you're going to do two to four practice exercises, and then you're going to do the actual real thing. So you're going to stay out in the woods the entire time. You'll bring a couple of extra sets of clothes. You'll bring a poncho because it's probably going to rain like it always does to put over your rucksack so that your stuff doesn't get completely soaked. And you're going to go out there and it's, it's game time for land navigation. So you spend the first day and a half or so, sometimes two days depending on the light, doing practical exercises. So overnight, they literally give you points to go walk and practice on the land navigation course itself. It's on, it's on the star course. So you're, you're just getting the reps in and understanding how to do this thing. You're practicing. You're getting lost. You're understanding kind of the terrain. You don't really get a good glimpse and understand like where you are because this, the area is so, so, so large that you can't really understand it. Sort of like the 12-mile ruck when you see the tank, you kind of know where you are because you're, you're getting close to the end and you know that. That is not the same with the Q course or with the star course because the distances are just too far. You never really get a good understanding of where you are ever. You can kind of game it in certain areas, but for the most part, you're not just looking around like, oh, I'm on this trail. That, that's never going to happen. A full night of practicums where you try to get as many points as possible. These aren't the graded points, but it, it's, it's actually really, really helpful. And what you're also doing is crushing your body. And then the next morning, you're going to do the same thing. And typically, you'll have one in the afternoon so that you can see it during the day. And what this does is this just gets you exhausted. You've been basically running and gunning for the last day or two, and you do two straight days of this. So then the next night, they're like, okay, next night's game time. So hopefully, you've been doing pretty well. And if not, you've been figuring out what you did wrong because there's a ton of people at this point who are in full panic mode because they haven't found one point yet. They've spent two days in the woods, and they literally got so lost from their start point that they could not find the first point. A number of guys this happens to. I was kind of in the middle of the pack where I got like an average of points. I can't remember exactly how many points we specifically had over the two-day practicums, but whatever it was, I got like 55% of it, something like that. I was kind of in the middle. I was like, okay, well, we've got to do a little bit better, but I think that now I've got it down. I, had it, I was better at the last night than I was at the first night by far. So it kind of built on itself. I, I figured out a couple things that I was doing wrong. I also discovered that I needed to walk faster and I needed to move quicker, uh, which I adjusted and then I subsequently adjusted my pace count. Then it's kickoff and it's the first night and it's like game time and you have to start this thing and the practicums are all behind you and it's literally showtime. So you show up, 
you're at a point, they like separate each of you guys and you all have your own starting points. And for me, we started at 10 p.m. and we had until 8 a.m. the next morning, and which is good because you get about an hour and a half of daylight depending on what season you get. For me, it was summer. Uh, so we get about an hour and a half of daylight in the morning. You've got a lensatic compass, you have a protractor, you have a map, and you have some markers that you can use. So for me, some classes, they're not allowed to do this. Some they are. I, I drew like the, the boundaries of the map. I drew, highlighted the road. And it was a, a marker that you buy that's compatible with the red lens. So when you look at your map, it really pops out like where the water is, where the contour lines are some of the external boundaries, a few of the roads, just like big key features that you should probably be aware of. I popped them out on the map using that specific marker because you can't, you have a headlamp on the entire evening, but you can never use white. You've got to consistently use red, which basically means one thing. You're not using it to look. You're just using it to read the map. Um, that's it. And, and then when you get to SUT later in the course, you can't even do that. You have to get under two ponchos you have to pull out two ponchos out of your rucksack anytime you want to look at your map and you have to lay down the prone with a buddy and like you guys systematically look at the map. During land navigation, it's not that serious, but you can never use white on your headlamp. Now, they don't make you bring red-specific headlamps. You can bring white or and red. Uh, it doesn't matter. You just can never have your white headlamp on. So you start this thing, and I'm going to give you guys just a quick excerpt <laughs> of how my beginning of land navigation started and I'm sure many of you have probably heard this story but for those of you that haven't there's a huge huge lesson to be learned and other people's failures so I want to tell you exactly what happened to me we started land navigation and they were like boom kick off and I was like okay sweet we had just got roughed up a little bit I was I was panting and like sweating there was a lot of things going on I got down pulled out all my information started plotting my points which I could do pretty good uh, I usually feel pretty pretty good about exactly where I put my point. That's exactly where I'm supposed to go. Did my azimuth, did everything. I was rocking, got up, just started completely hauling ass in the direction I was supposed to be going. And I was rocking for hours, literally two to three hours, crushing it, heading in the direction I'm, I was supposed to. I think my movement was somewhere around 10 kilometers, you know, eight, eight miles ish, give or take something like that, which takes forever through the woods. I mean, it's not like walking on, concrete or a track or anything like that. I mean, you're moving through this, this brush that's not very forgiving, um, through trees, through bushes, through swamps, through like all these crazy vines. It, it's tough. It's tough to stay on azimuth because sometimes you have to go around those things. So after about two to three hours and I'm walking through this open field with all of these, uh, cut down logs. So they came in so glad they came in and they cut down a lot of these trees for whatever reason, who knows, but just acres and acres of cut down trees, which is so incredibly frustrating because trying to walk across just down timber after down timber after down timber is a complete disaster in terms of counting your pace, keeping up the rate that you typically do, and then staying on azimuth. You're just waiting to twist your ankle and fall with this huge rucksack. But anyways, I, I, I'm, I'm just continuing along and I'm swinging my arms and I'm like kind of really moving fast. And I look at my hands and I realize that they're freely moving. And like I'm really getting into this kind of like a power walker or something, like some old lady with a stroller just like getting after it with my hands. Because you got a lot of weight in your back and who cares what you look like? I'm just trying to crush this thing. And I realize that my arms are moving around a lot while I'm rucking. And then I look at my hands and I realize, damn it that I don't have my weapon. I left my weapon at the starting point three hours behind me. And I'm just in a pure panic mode. I just sit there and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. We started this thing literally within minutes, seconds of starting land navigation. I left probably the most important item up leaning up against a tree while I was doing push ups and sit ups and like crawling through the mud for the cadre members. And now I've got to go all the way back <laughs> and go find this thing to the exact same spot we we were at, the exact tree that I leaned up against in the middle of the night. And hopefully none of the million cadre members who are around saw it and picked it up because if they did, I'm 100% dead. So I turned back around. I actually got back there rather quickly because I kind of knew where I was going. I didn't have to navigate as much. Uh, I would say it took me 
maybe an hour and a half to get back. And I get back there and no joke walked right up to the exact same tree because we started in an intersection. So it was, it was actually kind of clear where I was walked right up to the tree, grabbed my rifle and was ready to rock. And no, the only thing is I wasted probably four hours of the night period, at least four hours of the night. And I was exhausted now. So I immediately got out some 550 cord and tied the rifle to my hand. Um, because that was never going to happen again. And I just felt lucky to be alive and not road killed or just completely slaughtered by someone or never finding it again. And then I began land navigation and it, it, it's a, it's a very tough course, number one, but it's also physically demanding because you're underneath the ruck a lot. You'll get blisters, you'll see snakes, you'll run into a million spider webs with spiders on them. It's, it's, it's like really intense being in the woods for that many hours overnight covering that much distance. You see like the real woods. Like we have guys that kicked over snake beds that had lots of snakes. I saw a few snakes uh, during my time in land navigation, probably three, not anything too crazy. I didn't see a bed of a bunch of them or anything like that. But you consistently walk through and feel like spiders on your face crawling down on your neck. You know, you're going through all these cobwebs because you're in the woods. I mean, you're, you're traveling, what, 20 miles plus a night just walking through the dead woods where all the deer are, maybe the bears. They've got all kinds of wildlife out there, and you're in it. And it's kind of cool to me because I, I grew up hunting, so it wasn't like a real big deal. The spiders kind of suck, but you're just so motivated and getting after it that you don't really care. You just crush them and keep walking. <laughs> 